All right, welcome everyone. It's now noon, so let's get started on our second live Q&A for DLS 105. So what we'll do today is uh, we're going to go start by going through the Module 1 quiz questions, which hopefully you can see on your screen. Uh, and then after that, I will step through uh, homework number two. And then from there, open it up to any questions that anybody might have on module two or really anything on the course up to this. Um, as we get through, go through the quiz questions and the homework, if you have questions, please feel free to either ask them over the phone or I'll also be monitoring the chat so you can type there and we'll do our best to get them answered. So I guess let's get started. So the module one quiz, starting with, Question number one. The so first question is, the branches from a node of an event tree must be? And the answer is going to be C there, all the above. So event tree branches must be mutually exclusive. We can't, they can't have any overlap. And then they also have to be collectively exhaustive. So everything coming off of a node, all those branches, they need to sum to one. So the so that one's the third one there. All so question number two, true or false, uh, event tree branches are conditional on all preceding pathway events. And that is true, and that's very important when we get into team elicitations and things like that to make sure that we are not double counting. So we are always evaluating a node conditional on the prior nodes being true. Question number three, probabilities along event tree pathways are, they are multiplied. And we'll see that when we get to question number six, where we had to actually put that into practice. Question number four, probabilities moving down across event tree branches are, and this time those are gonna be summed. And we'll also see that in question number six. So anytime we're going across pathways, we're multiplying. When we're down across branches, they'll be summed. All right, this next one, question number five, requires a little bit of math. So we've got events A, B, and C, and they are independent events. Event A has a probability of 0.3, event B has a probability of 0.6, and event C has a probability of 0.4. What is the probability of union for these events? Now, there's a couple different ways you can do it. Uh, the easiest way is going to be to use De Morgan's rule, where we will take one minus the product of the complements. So again, the complement is going to be minus the probability. So I got one minus one minus the probability of A, one minus the probability of B, and one minus the probability of C. Uh, the other way, I don't have it drawn out, but would be basically to go through the joint model and to get all the different combinations. So there'd be several since we've got three different events, but it would be, you know, the probability of A times the prob the complement of B times the complement of C. A times, or A, excuse me, B times the complement of A times the complement of C until you get all the scenarios. So A by itself, B by itself, C by itself, a and B together, B and C together, A and C together, A, B and C together. So that's a way to do it, but it's a lot more labor intensive and you got to keep some things straight. It's way easier to do it like I've done it here using De Morgan's rule, one minus the product of the complements. Okay. And then our last question, uh, given the event tree below, what is the probability of overtopping failure? So looking at this tree, we need to go through the different pathways that result in an overtopping failure. And there's going to be two of them. One that goes through where the foundation liquefies, and then one that goes through where the foundation doesn't liquefy. So to do that, I need to get my end node probabilities, so I'm going to multiply um, the probabilities along each pathway. So this will be 0.175 times 0.05 to get that probability. And then the second, prob 
second pathway will be 0 0.825 times 0.425, and then they get the total, I'll sum those. So when I do that, I get 359, which was not listed uh, as one of your choices. So the correct answer for that one is going to be none of the above. Okay. Um, obviously, a made-up example because the probability of overtopping failure is higher when the foundation doesn't liquefy. It's probably not going to happen in reality, but for our purposes, that's what the correct answer is going to be. All right. So, any questions on Module One quiz or any of those questions that we just went over? From the results, it looks like most people did very well with it. So I was happy to see some of the concepts are starting to make sense. All right, if there are no questions on the module one quiz, we'll start diving into homework number two. All right, so I've got the homework two spreadsheet up on the screen there, we are asked to generate the little and big FN charts <laughs> given the day. Uh, we are told to discretize the stage frequency relationship in the 10 even intervals and to include non-exceedance. And then for all the system response relationships, we're told to use semi-logarithmic interpolation where we're going linear for peak stage and then log for system response probabilities. And then when we start looking at uh, consequences for our exposure scenarios, we're told to assume an 11-hour workday. All right, so scrolling down, I've got the uh, project event tree here, pretty standard. We're going straight from stage frequency to the four different failure modes that we have. Uh, we have day and night exposure, and it goes to life loss. Um, in practice, we would have one more branch where we would look at the economic cost, but to try to keep the example a little simpler, I didn't ask you to do that. And because if you can calculate the life safety risk, you can also do the economic cost. The only thing that changes is instead of using life loss or fatalities, we, we move over to dollar and cents. Okay. So first thing we're going to do from this table, we're going to um, partition our hazard into even intervals, then we are going to interpolate to get our marginal system response probabilities. We'll calculate the complements, and then we're told to use competing risk to get our adjusted system response. All right, so starting with our hazard, the uh, first stage of the first interval is going to be set equal to the lowest peak stage in our stage frequency relationship. And then our highest. Or our Your message one, for Karina Summer. Hope we're not leaving somebody a message. Everybody still there? Yeah, that was a bit weird. I still copy you, Damon. All right, very good. Sorry, so this in this um, last row here, we're going to put our highest hazard from our stage relationship. Okay, so then to get our second stage, because we are doing um, even partitions, we are going to take that first stage, and then we are going to add to it the difference of our highest stage minus our lowest stage, and because we have 10 intervals, the uh, denominator there is going to be n minus 1 with n being the number of um, intervals, so that'll be 10 minus 1, which is 9. You should get that number right there. So then the second interval is going to pick up where the first one left off, so we'll start with um, that stage right there. And then I should be able to drag everything down from there. And if I did it right, this last one should match up with my highest stage, which it does. OK. 
Okay, so now I have my even bins and I'm ready to start interpolating for the system response. So when I try to get the, or when I calculate the uh, marginal SRP for a hazard interval, I want it for the midpoint of the interval. So that midpoint is going to be the average of the two stages that define the interval. So we were told to do uh, semi-log interpolation. So that function is going to be lin log int. I need my x value, which is going to be the midpoint of the interval. So I'm going to take the average of those two numbers. And then I'm going to scroll up and find the system response for PFM1. I need my X array, which is going to be the peak stage. And I'll hit F4 to lock those rows and columns. And then I need the Y array, which is going to be the system response. I'll lock those as well. And then I want a 1 because it's in ascending order. And then a 0 because we are not extrapolating. That should give me the um, probability for the system response of PFM1 at the midpoint of this first hazard interval. So then from there, because I've locked the rows and columns, this equation is essentially going to stay the same. The only thing that's changing is that first input. So I'm going to use the different midpoints of the different intervals as I work my way down. So I can just take this and drag this all the way down. And, and complete out that column, okay? It even works for this last one because it doesn't treat the uh, greater than sign as a number. It just cre cre uh, treats it as that, basically a blank cell. So the average of one number, 581.1, is 581.1. All right, so now that I have it for all the numbers I need for failure mode one, I'm gonna repeat that process for failure modes two, three, and four. Now, I could go through and type all that in again, um, but I find it easier just to go ahead and copy that formula. I'll move it over and paste it in. So I'm still referencing the same um, stages for my interval, but now I need to move this over to failure mode two so I can grab these rectangles and move them over. So I'm interpolating same way I did for PFM1, I'm just now using the data for PFM2. I get that set. And then I'll do the same thing for PFM3. And then again for PFM4. And I'll say as I'm doing this, the more and more you do these calculations, the more and more you find these little tips and tricks to help speed them up and do them quicker. All right, so I should have, I've got all the um, system response probabilities that I need marginally. So now I need the system response probability complements. So to do that, the complement is just gonna be one minus the probability. So for this one, I'm going to grab PFM1 there. And since it's going to be the same formula, just referencing different cells, I should be able to just drag this over and down and get all the system response complements. So like for that last one, I'm grabbing the system response for PFM4 at the last interval, and I'm taking one minus that number. All right. All right. Last piece to uh, finish out this table is to uh, adjust the system response probabilities using competing risk. And this is probably the most painful or complicated part of the entire homework. Um, but not too bad once you get the hang of it. I'm actually going to move this top row up because it's going to make a few things a little bit easier. So if you remember, each hazard can be thought of as um, hazards defined as Q, so it's Q1, 
two, three, four, so on and so forth. That didn't work. Let's write down. I would have thought that would have just filled it in for me. Okay, so this first one always responds to Q1. So we are not given Q0, but Q0, our, our initial system response at hazard Q0 is always going to be zero for the failure modes. So I've added this row in here so I can punch some zeros in. What that's going to allow me to do is it's, I'm not going to have to um, have a different formula for my first interval by adding this row in. I can then go ahead and co calculate the complement for those. Oops. It's just going to be one minus that, which you can guess is going to equal to one. And then these first ones are always going to be zero as well. All right. So now to do competing risk, I'm going to start with the adjusted system response for the prior interval. So for Q1, that is going to be the adjusted system response at Q0, which is zero. I'm going to add to that the difference between the marginal system response for PFM1 at Q1 and Q0. So I'm taking the marginal at Q1 and subtracting from it the marginal at Q0. I'm going to multiply that term by 0.5. And then I need the, um, the survival functions at Q1 and Q0 of the other failure modes. So for this one, I need, I'm working on PFM1, so I need the survival function of failure modes 2, 3, and 4. So I'll take the complement at PFM2. Multiply that by the complement at three, multiply that by the complement at four. And then I want to add to that the survival function for the um, prior interval, so Q0. So I'm going to do the same thing there. I'm going to get it for PFM2, PFM3, and PFM4. If I've done that right, I should come up with 1.5 times 10 to the minus 6. So then what's nice about that is once I have that formula set, I should be able to just drag it down and all my references should continue to work the rest of the way. We're doing the same thing. We're just using um, different data for the, the different hazard levels that we're looking at. Okay. So what you'll see is that the adjusted probability that we calculated for PFM1 is going to be ever so slightly lower than what we had for the marginals. And again, what we're doing is we're taking into account those intersection probabilities and so that it's going to reduce the marginal system response by some amount. So now that we've done it for PFM1, we are going to repeat that process for PFM2. Easiest way that I know to do it is to go ahead and copy that formula. And then again, instead of uh, referencing the marginals for PFM1, I want them for PFM2. And then for my SRP complements, my survival function is going to be um, for PF. Stems one, three, and four. So I can just move what I had over here. So now I'm referencing one, three, and four. And then I need the initial adjusted system response for PSM2. So once I've done that, I should be set. I can grab that and take that all the way down as well. I'll do the same thing for PSM3. And I like kind of going you know, one side to the other because it's easy to kind of move your cells over one spot and not get confused as to what you're missing.
and we'll do it for PFM4. That should be it. Okay. Any questions on that before moving on? Like I said, I think doing the competing risk adjustment is one of the tougher things that you know we're doing in this module. Um, once we get past um, module three, you'll never have to do it by hand again. The different software and spreadsheet tools that we have will do it for you, which is pretty convenient. All right, so now that I have this table filled out, I'm set to start doing the uh, marginal risk calculations for the different failure modes, and then also to get the uh, total risk. So when I'm doing the marginal cal calculations for each failure mode, I'm going to want to use the marginal system response probabilities. When I start getting into each of their contribution to the total, that is when I want to use the adjusted system response probabilities. Okay, so again, the marginal is the risk associated with the failure mode, regardless of the impact of other failure modes that are out there. Whereas the contribution to the total takes into account the other failure modes presence and slightly reduces the risk of a given failure mode because you know it, it's taking into account that intersection and if it fails by you know one mode it can't fail by the other modes as well at least that's what competing risk says all right so first thing we need to do the calculations for um psm um one is to get the uh loading probability so to do that, I need to interpolate off our stage frequency curve to get the annual exceedance probability of the first stage, and then I'm going to subtract from that the AEP, or annual exceedance probability, of the second stage. So that's going to be, because all stage frequency curves are on a probability scale, we're always going to use uh, lin v int for that one. So I'm going to grab my first stage. I'm going to scroll up here and find my stage frequency relationship. So the X-ray is going to be those um, elevations right there. And the Y-array is going to be the ADP. So that's what I got for stage one. And the equation for stage two is going to be essentially the same, but I need to move over a row. So I'm going to go to C82, but then the arrays are going to be the same. So then I scroll up here and grab that one as well. Now you'll notice I, I did not add the ones and the zeros to the formula. Uh, if you don't, um, the formula defaults and it assumes that it's a one and a zero. Um, you can put them in or leave them out. I typically leave them out. Um, really doesn't um, change the result, or it won't change the result at all. Um, those inputs are really only needed if um, it's in descending order, and then if you want to extrapolate for some reason. Now, that gives me the probability of being within this spin, but the first spin, I still need the um, non-exceedance probability, and I'll come back and add that in just a second. So I can take this and drag this all the way down. Um, this last one is not going to work quite, quite right because I've got the two different stages. And really, I only need the AEP at this stage. So I'm going to get into this equation and delete this first part. All right. So that's the exceedance probability for the last spin. I need to um, go back in and um, add the non-exceedance probability. So to do that, I'm going to take 1 minus 
the annual exceedance probability for stage one. So that's one minus, and then I can grab this function right here, and then I should be set. So if I've done that correctly, these should all sum to one, which they do. If I hadn't added this term in, let's go ahead and take it out and show you what happens. So if that term wasn't in there, I'm going to get whatever the AEP is for that lowest stage. So in this case, I'm getting 9.99, 10 to the minus 1, which for all intents and purposes is 1, but not quite 1. And we're engineers and we care about decimals, so we will add that last little piece in there to make sure that it all sums to 1. So collectively exhaustive, we are um, satisfying all the rule, entry rules like we're supposed to. So the next step, uh, these co we've got columns for day and night exposure. We were told to assume an 11-hour workday. So for the daytime, that's going to be 11 hours over the total number of hours in a day, which is 24. And I get a 45, 46 um, percent probability there. So then to get the night, I can either take the complement of that, 1 minus, or I can think about what's left over, which I think was 13 hours. And again, if I did this right, these two should also sum to 1, which they do. And the, these values are going to be same for all the different hazard intervals. So the next, I need to um, interpolate off of the life loss relationships and do a little math to get the incremental life loss. So if we remember, the incremental life loss is going to be our breach life loss minus our non-breach life loss. And we're going to want to find that for the midpoint of each hazard interval. So I am going to in linearly interpolate. That's lin int. I need the midpoint of my hazard interval. So I'll take the average of those two numbers. And then I'll scroll up here. And we're working with failure mode 1. So we have the life loss here. The um, X-ray is going to be the peak stage. I'm going to lock those rows and columns. The Y-ray is going to be the day life loss. Lock those as well. I'll add the ones and zeros this time. And then I want to subtract from that the non-breach life loss for this interval. So I need the midpoint again. The average. And then I'll scroll up here, and I need this for my X-ray, and then this for the Y array. Add the ones and zeros again. So that should give me the incremental life loss for the daytime for my first partition, and then I can. Grab that guy and drag it all the way down because the formula stays the same. The only thing that's changing is I'm referencing a different midpoint stage. So then to do it for the night, the equation is going to be exactly the same, except instead of referencing the day life loss, we want to um, reference the night life loss instead. So again, I, I, you can type it in if you want. I find it way easier to go ahead and pick, copy and paste that formula verbatim and then drag those rectangles over to get to the nighttime stuff. Drag that down and we're set. All right. So, <coughs> excuse me. So to get the uh, marginal risk, we need our marginal SRP, which we can pull directly from the table above. I'll just set that equal to the marginal for PFM1. Now, the annual probability of failure is going to be equal to our loading or hazard probability times our system response. So 
So that is going to be this number right here multiplied by this number right here. And I can drag that down. Again, loading probability times our system response. So then to get our average annual life loss, that's going to be our annual probability of failure times our exposure weighted incremental life loss. Now, I know in the presentation example, I gave you um, an extra cell or an extra column to compute the weighted life loss. In most of the spreadsheet tools that we have, it's all kind of done in one step. So that's why I did not give it to you for the homework, just so you could kind of practice and make sure you knew where everything was coming from. So for here, again, it's going to be our APS times our exposure-weighted incremental life loss. So that's going to be our day exposure times our day life loss plus our night exposure times our night life loss. And then I can then drag that all the way down. So with this part of the table filled out, I now have everything I need to, to um, get my total annual probability of failure and average annual life loss for PFM1. And I'm going to calculate that out to the side here. So to do that, I sum up the annual probability of failure across all intervals. And then I'll do the same for the average annual life loss. And then my N bar, which is the average number of fatalities per failure, I'm going to take the average annual life loss and divide that by the uh, annual probability of failure. So that should give me what I need to plot PFM1 right there. Now remember on the FN chart, for individual failure modes, we will always plot the marginal for the individual failure modes, and then we'll um, pull all their contributions together to plot the total. So the next, to finish out this table, I need the contribution of the total. Pretty much everything's the same, but instead of using the marginal system response probability, I'm going to now use the adjusted system response probability. I'll pull from this set right here for PFM1. Annual probability of failure is still going to be the loading probability times my system response. And then the average annual life loss is going to be the APF times the exposure weighted incremental life loss. I got my APS, day exposure times day life loss plus night exposure times night life loss. And that's that. So you can see really not much difference on this first one. The sum of that is 276. We came up 276 marginally. So the competing risk, the adjustment that we made didn't make a huge bit of difference, but, you know, sometimes the um, impact it has is bigger than others. And that's typically when you have multiple failure modes that kind of plot all around the same order of magnitude, especially if those probabilities are high. Okay. So any questions on what we just did there for PFM1? So we're going to go through and do the exact same thing for PFM 2, 3, and 4. Just rinse and repeat this. Yeah, go ahead, Angel. A quick question on the contribution total. Would you be sure mm -hmm. the formula for the APF? So for the contribution to the total, I am going, eventually I'm going to sum those up. So what's going to happen is when I get to the total down here, 
this value is going to be the sum of all of the APFs across all failure modes. Yes, yeah. just wanted to see the contribution total for the PFM1 in just a multiplication of, uh, meaning just any any cell of PF1, of APF contribution total. So you just wanted to see the number? Am I following right? Uh, would you click M84? M84. Yeah, that, yeah, that's what I needed. Is confirms. Okay, thank you. Got it. You bet. All right, let's go back. I don't need that. All right. I'm sorry. So Could now you we're going to show the uh, formula for the loading probability. Quick. So again, for this one, I'm taking the. I'm going to do um, z variate interpolation. So linear for stage, z variate for the probability. This first input is going to be stage one. The X array is going to be the peak stage. And then the Y array is going to be the annual exceedance probability. So this, so in this equation, this first set right here, that's giving me the AEP for stage one. The second set, you'll notice it's pretty much the same. I've just split over one. That's going to give me the AEP for stage two. So to get the loading probability, it's the AEP of stage one minus the AEP of stage two. And since I'm talking in acronyms, the AEP is the annual exceedance probability. Okay, thank you. Does that help? So these will all have the same equation here. The first one's a little different because I added in on exceedance. And then the last one's a little different because it's just an exceedance probability. I only have one elevation. Understood. Thank you. Cool. All right. Any other questions? Yes. This is Michael. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the uh, peak stage versus life loss is interpolated uh, with uh, Lin int, correct? Yes. Yes. And, and yet, when we graph our life loss on the axis, it's logarithmic. Is this a process? Are we supposed to use Lin int, or does it work just as well under log, or is it just a, something? process decided that you just go ahead and use linear for life loss numbers. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it, it's mostly process decided. So we do linear for life loss. Uh, there's a slide in module two that summarizes, you know, what we use for different things typically. Stage is going to be linear. Um, things like inflow and outflow are going to be log. Probabilities are generally going to be Z variate, but sometimes log, like you'll see that when we get into earthquake failure modes, they plot the seismic hazard curve on a um, on a log scale. So we'll, we'll match how they plot that one. Um, life loss is linear, overtopping depth is gonna be linear, things like that. But yeah, so for increment for the life loss, we, we always use linear for the life loss portion. So the Z interpolation is usually left for the AEP probability distribution interpolations. Generally speaking, yes. Sometimes right. people Thank will you. use it. Sometimes people will use it for system response. It it really doesn't result in that big a difference whether you use log or Z for system response. And I think we talked about it in module two about how plotting on a probability scale is a colossal pain in Excel. So 
just out of expedience and convenience, we will often just use log for system response. Now, I will say that, you know, the more intervals you have, I guess the, the less it matters typically. Oh yeah. That's okay. generally true. So like if I, you know, if I do a really good job of defining my system response and instead of five points, I use 30, you know, the spaces where I'm actually interpolating are going to be so much narrower that it really isn't going to matter what method I use because they're all so close together. But so it's your, your precision or accuracy is going to be, I forget which one is which, but um, it's going to be dependent on how many points you're interpolating in between. All right. Okay. Do you mind clicking still M82 for just a second? M82. Okay. Okay. And then, okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. That work? All right. Sometime to end of today, today, or tomorrow. I will try to have Taylor send out the solution file for homework two. So, if, so if we get through and this and you still have questions, that that can help, or we can even troubleshoot at the end of the call. That helped. I, I got it. I got it there. Thank you. Awesome. All right. So let's move into PFM two. So. This entire first part of the table is already kind of populated for you. It's exactly the same as what we had for PFM1. We've got the same exposure. We've got the same life loss. We're looking at the same hazard intervals. So the loading probabilities are all the same. Only thing that we need to do is we need to pull in the correct system responses. So first we need the marginal for, for PFM2. We'll grab that. And then we need the I'll go ahead and do it. Grab the adjusted system response for PFM2. If you want, because everything's laid out the same, you could copy and paste these cells and paste them down and then do the same over here. I'm going to go ahead and redo the calc just to help make things clear as to what's going on. Um, our APF is always going to be our loading probability times our system response. We'll do that for both of them. Loading probability times system response equals the APF. And then average annual life loss again is going to be the APF times our exposure weighted incremental life loss. So I got day times day and night times night. And the same thing over here but with a different APF. So we get PFM2, I'll sum the APFs from the marginal column, and then I'll sum the average annual life losses also from the marginal column, and then divide the average annual life loss by the APF. So you get something like that. All right. Rinse and repeat for PFM3. So we'll go grab this guy right here. And then grab this guy right here. And then I should be able to just copy and paste this down. It should do what I want it to do. Because everything's set up the same way. It should, looks like it worked. So the 
marginal risk for PFM3 should look something like that there. All right, so we got one more to look through. Uh, we've got an extra column to work through because the life loss for PFM4 is different than what it was for the other three, and this can happen. Sometimes failure modes are, have different life loss because of their formation time, their breach sizes, just basically differences in breach characteristics depending on where you are on the project. So I will need to um, linear interpolate again, so that'd be lint int. I need the midpoint of my hazard interval. Maybe these two right there. And then I need to scroll up and find the life loss for PFM4. So that will be from this table here. So this will be my X-Array. This will be my Y-Array. And then I'm going to subtract. So that gives me the breach life loss for the day. I need to subtract from it the non-breach life loss. So again, we'll use the same formula, but now I need to reference the non-breach life loss table. I really wish that every time I hit F4, it didn't take me all the way back down, but is what it is. All right, so I've got my breach day life loss minus my breach um, night, excuse me, my non-breach day life loss. Breach minus non-breach. Much lower life loss for PFM4 than for the other three. So then I'll repeat that for the night. Again, the easiest way, copy that formula, move it over. And I should just be able to drag those over. Breach night minus non-breach night. It's something that looks like that. All right, so now I need the my system response probabilities, so I'll go find the marginal for the FM4 that I already calculated, and then the adjusted probability for PFM4. APF equals the loading probability times the system response. And then the average annual life loss is the APF times the exposure weighted incremental life loss. Day times day, night times night. And to kind of speed things up, I'm going to go ahead and copy that because I know I'm going to need it in column N here in a minute. Then same thing over here, APF times that piece that I just typed out and copied. So then to get what I need for PFM4, that's going to be the sum of the marginal APF, sum of the marginal average annual life loss, and then the average annual life loss divided by the APF. So when all is said and done, I should have, um, this is how the potential failure mode should plot out on the SN chart. So the last thing I need to complete this plot is going to be the total. And all I need to do is sum up the contribution to the totals that I calculated in the far right side of the table. I'm going to do that for all failure modes. I'm going to scroll up to, I need to grab the APF for PFM1, the APF for PFM2, PFM3, and PFM4. And the total APF should be 2.05 times 10 to the minus 4. 
do the same thing for the average annual life loss. So grab it for one, two, three, and four. Get them all? Yep. So the average annual life loss will then be 8.91 times 10 to the minus 3. And then I will calculate in by taking the average annual life loss and dividing by the annual probability of failure. So we'll see that the total is just a little bit higher than um, the FM3. Risk-wise, it's very strongly driven by PFM3. You'll notice that um, 8.91 to the minus 3 versus 8.2 times 10 to the minus 3. So the vast majority of the risk for this project is being driven by PFM3. You get a little bit of a, um, a bump from PFM4, which is pulling the annual probability of failure up, but really one and four have similar risk, even though PFM4 is more likely because they plot on a similar diagonal. Okay. So questions on that before I get into making the big FN plot? Yeah, Damon, this is Michael again. Mm -hmm. So so we use the adjusted values to create the contribution to total numbers and plot the total with the adjustments in place. Why is it yeah. not better to use the adjusted values to plot the individual PFMs? Well, I mean, I understand you can say logically, like, you can't really sum them. So we do these adjustments to be statistically correct, and it cleans up the total. So the total plot's right. right. Is it then not a good plan to so, plot the PFMs? Yeah. Yeah, no, this is a good question. So reason being, when we start um, trying to reduce the risk associated with potential failure modes, and let's say you know, a really good example is one similar to what we saw in the presentation example, where we'll say we had the same failure mode at two different locations. Well, one of them is going to dominate the total, and the other won't. Whatever the maximum is, it's going to dominate the total. If I fix that one, but not the other, then I really haven't changed the risk because that other one's going to pop back up. So in other words, in because there's interplay between the different failure modes, you're kind of masking what the actual risk is for the failure mode. For example, if, again, if a failure mode precludes another, well, if I fix that one and that one can't happen, well, now the other one can. So you, you get into this scenario where, you know, you've got points that are kind of increasing once you fix one versus the other. So to avoid that and to get a very clean picture of what each failure mode actually represents, we plot the marginal. So again, that's that failure mode, regardless of what other failure modes are out there. So that way I know if I, you know, like in this example, I fix three, then, you know, that's where four is gonna be, that's where the total is gonna move to. So it, it gives you a, a more clear picture when you start getting into um, reducing the risk and what it's gonna take to actually reduce the total. Does that help? I might be able to yes, dig up an ex uh, I might be able to dig up an example of where that's really apparent that that's come up a couple times. It's just you know if you see again because of interplay between failure modes, something plotting down at the bottom of the chart, you think you don't have to fix it, but then when you fix one, it jumps up higher. It just it gets confusing. So we always part plot the marginal. Um, the other reason is. If you remember going back to um, module one, we talk about the real risk, depending on failure mode correlation, being somewhere between the um, De Morgan's rule total and the um, highest failure mode. 
we're kind of giving a nod to the unimodal balance theorem, which basically says the true risk lies somewhere in between these two. So that's another way to look at it. Thank you. That that makes sense. Just awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Um, Damien, would you please uh, come back for all the you know the failure uh, potential failure mode and uh, calculate the n values for both marginal and contribution to total individually. So the. Talking for for example, for the first one, yeah, for the first one, um, yeah, uh, for the marginal one, calculate n value, and for the con uh, contribution to total, uh, calculate the n value. Uh, would you please do that? Yeah. Sure. So if we were to plot its contribution to the total. Like it would be about the same. Thing, yes. Ever so slightly less. You want to see it for the other ones as well? Yes, please. Yes. Those are exactly the same. Cool. They are exactly the same, right? Yeah, the middle ones are, yes. So what basically uh, uh, does it tell you? It's just, you know, because the, the, the common area is small, so it doesn't impact really the difference between marginal and, you know, the so the, the marginal risk the marginal risk being similar to the um, what its contribution to the total, all that means is there wasn't much intersection between the failure modes. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was to imply. So it's just saying that that common area is a small, so they are close. Based so on for example, so for example, if we hadn't bothered with adjusting for the intersection by whatever method yes. we wanted to use we had just summed everything together it really wouldn't have made much difference in no, this case it, it didn't. No. Yeah, that that implies that we don't have like intersection between the you know the failure modes they are just completely uh different you know they don't have well, any well, uh, what, no, what we're saying, it. yeah, it's not that they can't happen at the same time. It's mm -hmm. just because their probabilities are already low enough. Yeah, it's really, really unlikely that they would. So whether we include it in the calculation or not, really would the matter in this case. Is that now, the true statement? Is that the truth? Sorry. Uh, uh, that's, a, that's a true statement for this particular example, but that's not always a true statement. There are times when the adjustment does matter. Like I said, that's typically when you have several failure modes with, you know, relatively high system response probabilities, then it can really matter. You can, you know, overinflate your risk by a factor of two, maybe even three, depending on how many failure modes you got. Um, so, because our tools are set up to do it, it's always recommended to go ahead and do it because it's not that hard. Like in in both of these, it's just picking a method and then the spreadsheet does it. You don't have to, it doesn't take any extra time. Same way when we get to total risk, we'll check a box and we click run and it's there. So, you know. So basically it happens when the probability is low for the failure modes. We can see that when the probability are low. Sorry, I, I, I didn't catch what you said there. Can you repeat that, please? So, 
it's the true statement that the, where the uh, when the probability are low for the failure mode, we can expect that there is no difference between you know the adjusted and you know the uh, marginal one. So they both give us yeah. the same you know n numbers. Okay. Yeah, certainly within the same order of magnitude. It, it, in most cases, it's probably not going to matter much. I mean, we're talking cents on the dollar, if you will. Um, yeah. But again, our our recommendation is to always go ahead and do it because sometimes it's not easy to tell if it's going to make a difference. You can kind of tell, it's easy to tell after the fact, but while you're doing it, it's not always obvious. So, you know, we'll go ahead and, and include it in our tools so that we get as accurate or precise an answer as we need and, you know, and then go from there. Thank you. Can I help? Yes. All right. Any any other questions on this one? Down here into the big FN chart. This will probably be the first and maybe the last time you ever make a big FN chart by your by yourself. This is my least favorite plot by far. All right, so let's get into it. So if you remember what this chart represents, this is the, I guess, the cumulative distribution of life loss. It's like a probability, life loss probability chart. So um, once we get it plotted, we can say, what's the probability of X or more fatalities? And then I can read that directly off this chart. So what I need, I need FN pairs for every failure mode and every exposure scenario. So every co different combination that we had from above. So I already have this table set up for you where I've got all the day scenarios for failure mode one and then all the night. Day for two, night for two, same things for three and four, and we're considering it over every hazard level as well. So to do this, it's 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 not super hard. We just got to um, do a good job with our bookkeeping. So we can we and when we do this, it says APF. We want the contribution to the total. That's the APF that we want to pull from. All right, so I need to go find the APF for PFM1. So I'm going to scroll up. That's going to be this guy right here, M82. And because these partitions are set up to be the same as what we had in the tables above, I can grab this and drag it all the way down to right there. So that completes the APF table for the day. Now for the night, the dam or levy or whatever kind of structure we're looking at doesn't really care if it's day or night. That only really matters for life loss. So the annual probability of failure is going to be the same. So I can then click equal and go up to that first one because these partitions are the same and then drag those down. What is different between the two of those is the exposure. So I'm going to use the day exposure for those day scenarios, which I don't know. I scrolled all the way up to the top. I could have picked any one of these because they're all the same. But day is going to be that 0.458. Drag that down. And then night is going to be the complement of that. So I can either go grab something from above or I can just go one minus the day exposure to get the night. Okay, so now I have enough to get the F part of my FN pairs, and that's just going to be the APF times the exposure. If I do that right, when I sum up all the little Fs, I should get the, you know, I've just got the ones for PFM1 here, so if I sum all these up, I should get the APF for PFM1. Four seven six times ten to the minus six. Is that 
what we had, 476 times 10 to the minus 6. So when we're done, when we do this for all the failure modes, and I add all these values up in column F, I should get the total annual probability of failure that I calculated earlier. Okay? So then to finish this part out, I need the life loss that corresponds to the failure mode and the scenario that I looked at. So for this one, I need the day life loss for, you know, hazard between 457 and 470.8. So that's going to be that first one right here. And then because of how the tables are laid out, I can just drag that down. So again, I'm matching the life loss with the corresponding failure mode, its scenario, and its hazard level. So then for the second part, I'm going to do the exact same thing, but instead of pulling the day life loss, I need the night life loss. Should be that one right here. And I can drag that down. So that gives me the SN pairs for PFM1. So then I'm going to repeat that for PFMs 2, 3, and 4. So I'm going to go through and do, instead of going left to right, I'm going to complete each column and then move to the next one. So let's go, I need the APF for PFM2. It's going to be this guy. Making sure they are all coming from column M, which they are. And then the day and the night are going to be the same. Go. Now I need the APF for failure mode three. Day and night are the same. APF for PFM four. That should get me what I need. Now, if I were to sum this table up, this entire column, I'm not going to get the APF. I'm going to get twice of whatever the APF is because I'm kind of double counting there because I've got it for the day and the night. It's only going to add up to be the um, APF that I calculated earlier if I apply the exposure. All right. So, Day and night exposure are going to be the same across all failure modes, and I've got the same number of scenarios for each. So I can just set that equal to um, the exposure for PFM1 here and just drag it all the way down. It looks like Excel had started to do some math for me, which was nice, but again, little f is going to be the APF times the exposure. APF times the exposure. I can drag that all the way down. Now, if I've done that right, again, I should get the 2.05 times 10 to the minus 4 that I calculated earlier, which I do. So we're good there. Okay. Last piece to fill out this table is going to be to um, pull the life loss values for PFMs 2, 3, and 4. So we can go up here and grab day life loss for PFM 2. And we just got to watch to make sure that we're not pulling things down too far. And then I need the night life loss. Now, a shortcut, because I know that um, failure modes 1, 2, and 3 all have the same life loss, I could have set it equal to PFM1 and just drag it down, but I think it's better to see where it comes from since that's not always going to be true. Uh, PFM3 night, so this guy right here. And then PFM4 definitely has different life loss. 
Grab the day there. And grab the night here. All right. So now I have all of my SN pairs. Um, it would have been nicer if whoever set up the spreadsheet, which I think was me, um, had made it SN instead of NF, just so you could have copied and pasted all in one um, one action, but we'll have to copy and paste in two different spots to make sure we got the right things in the right column. So I'm copying and I'm pasting as values, little f over, and then I'm copying and pasting as values in over as well. All right. So the next step before we can calculate big F is to um, to sort these. I want to sort them by the N value, and I want to sort them from the highest N down to the lowest N. So I'll go data, I'll go sort, I'm going to sort N largest to smallest. I should have that set right there. And then to get big F, that's going to be, I'm just going to sequentially keep adding these little Fs together. So the first one is going to be just equal to this, what's in this cell right here. And then the next one is going to be what I just had for the um, prior N plus the little F. This plus a little f, so on, so forth, all the way down. And when it's finished, again, this last value here should be equal to the total APF that we calculated earlier, which it does, 2.05 times 10 to the minus 4. Technically, the next step of this would be to um, take this and plot it stepwise. Um, the tools will do that for you now. Uh, I think it's kind of a you know worthless exercise because you'll never have to do it by hand. And really, if you have enough partitions, if you break it broke down your failure modes up enough that you won't even be able to tell whether it's stepwise or not. It all tells you the same thing. So I guess it's your choice. If you ever have to do one of these by hand, it's your choice whether or not you want to be lazy or not. Um, the last piece, since this is a CDF, that line needs to continue all the way over. So I'll come down here at the bottom, Oop. and I'll add one more point to extend that line out. You could just draw it in, or again, I like to add that last little row there, and then I can drag these down. And now it looks the way it's supposed to. Okay. Any questions on anything I just did there? Yeah, the big FN chart really isn't that hard to put together, but when you start getting more failure modes with, you know, 50, 60 partitions between them, it becomes more about data management and making sure that you have everything where you need it. You're not, you know, you're calling the right cells. So you got to make sure that you're doing really well on your bookkeeping so that you don't make a, a mistake when you're putting this together. Cool. APS from M works better than marginal from column J. Um, so, Michael, I think what you're asking for is, you know, why are we using the um, contribution to the total versus marginal or? Just what's the, what's the spiel for it? I know we do it, but I don't know why. So, we could individually plot 
um, each failure mode on the big FN chart if we wanted to. Uh, we typically don't. Again, what we're trying to show is basically the um, a probability distribution of um, the life loss. So because of how they interact and because this is representative of the total risk associated with the project, we want the contribution to the total when we make it. So that's why here I'm pulling from column M exclusively um, instead of the marginals from column J. So the big FN chart, we're always using the adjusted total. Excellent, thank you. Yep. Anyone else? Damon, I have a question about combining failure modes. So mm -hmm. the, the piece that kind of <laughs> messed me up, or at least, you know, kind of made me rethink what I was doing on this one was the lecture where it's talking about combining failure modes when multiple pathways of the same failure mechanism are evaluated and there's the same consequences and whatnot. And, I, and so how do, how do we know in this example, this homework, that we don't have to combine failure modes? You don't. So in this example, you weren't given enough information to really know what PFM 1, 2, 3, and 4 are. Yeah, okay. Um, in practice, you will know what those failure modes are. You'll know what pathways you're evaluating, what exit conditions, and then you can go from there. Um, I guess I, next time I can add something in the um, homework description to be a little more explicit about what I'm asking for there. But um, as you've alluded to, the only time we want to, again, combine those first and take the maximum between pathways is when we've got that same mechanism with the same kind of consequences. Reason we do that is because learning something about one kind of tells you something about the other. There's a correlation there. So if, you know, all things being equal, if I've got these two pathways that are all the same, but one shorter than the other, that short one's gonna happen first, which means the second one can't. So I'm gonna pick the max of that one. So that means if the first one doesn't fail, then the second one also won't fail. So we're leveraging what we know and we're basically applying that correlation to um, make sure we don't overinflate the total. Because what could happen, let's say we take that mechanism, I've got the same mechanism over a station range and I evaluate three different pathways and include them all and calculate the total. Well, if I had to split it into five pathways or eight pathways or 20 pathways, the more and more pathways that I keep creating, if I keep adding those into the total, my total risk will be a, a function of how many pathways I looked at, and that's not right. So that's why we take the max to make sure that we're not um, double counting within the same mechanism. Does that help? So again, for this yeah. example, it wasn't specified. Yeah, and we, we wanted to just um, run them all through the calcs. Yep, makes sense. Just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing something there. Something more obvious. Okay. Nope, sounds like you're good. Thanks. Oh, um, we're getting close to the end and somebody just asked what the buzzword is for this one. For for module two, the bu buzzword is going to be discretizing. Discretizing. And that'll be the first question on your quiz through um, Socrative. And just as a reminder here, you know, we'll go to Socrative.com, we'll click student login. Um, for this one, the quiz is we're going to be in a different room. Um, so 
That room name is going to be DLS 105R2 for module 2. Type in your name and then go from there. There should be, I think, outside of the buzzword, I think there's five questions this time. A couple simple calculations, um, a couple things, a couple questions to answer, and then go from there. But the, the buzzword for this round is discretizing. Okay. Uh, hey, Damon. So, just a quick question. Yeah. Uh, this is Kristen with Stantec. Uh, why not common cause adjustment? Why are we using competing so, adjustment? Right. So both of them are going to give you the same total APS, whichever one you use. You're going to get the exact same total APS. However, the way common cause is weighting and distributing that intersection really doesn't have much basis in reality. It's just saying, well, this failure mode is bigger than this one, so it deserves a bigger chunk of the intersection. Competing risk, on the other hand, you know, will actually, you know, it actually models what happens in reality. So if, if something fails by a failure mode, Generally speaking, it's not probably not going to fail by the other two. So we go through and we look at those different combinations. So like if I had three failure modes, I'm looking at failure mode one, but not two or three. Failure mode two, but not one or three. Failure mode three, but not one or two. So it's just more representative of what would happen in reality. So that when you start um, applying your life loss, those contributions make, um, you get a better contribution. Um, really, the best way to do it is to use joint risk. That covers all the different scenarios that you could possibly have. That is going to be your best answer. But it's also labor intensive. You need to make you know, you need to have a lot of consequence runs to do that. And oftentimes, kind of like we saw in this example, whatever method you use really doesn't make much difference. So, you know, we typically only use that when we're um, using more high-powered software that can do all the work for us. Th does that help answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Very good. It it's not so much that common cause is wrong per se it's just it was kind of like a hack to make sure that we got the right APS and that's about as good as it was um, most of our previous risk assessments used common cause but moving forward you're going to see a shift throughout um, Corps of Engineers risk assessments and we'll be using either competing risk or joint risk um, um, I was going to say, the, um, the uh, new version of the levy screening to LST 2.0 uses competing risk now. So things to keep in mind. All right. Any, any other questions? Yes. Yeah, did go ahead. You, did you send a confirmation of homework received? This time, I will. I have. I have not. I've been swamped this week, and I'm sorry. I'm slacking on those. So I'll make sure that you know confirmation that I got your homework will get sent out either this afternoon or sometime tomorrow, probably. Thank you. Thank. Thank you for the reminder. You mentioned you're going to send out the uh, solution for uh, module yep. two. Did you send out the solution for the homework for one? Um, sure, I can do that as well. I'll send them both. Thank you. I don't know if um, Taylor's going to be in today or tomorrow, but within the next couple of days, we'll get that sent out. Could you please uh, go back to the big F column one more time? Thank you. 
any specific questions with it? No, I just got lost. That's perfect. Thank you. Very good. And if any other questions come up between now and really any time during the end of the course, just by all means send me an email or or feel free to give me a call and we'll try to work through it. All righty. If nobody has any other questions, that's a uh, wrap for the Module 2 live Q&A. Um, the Module 3 presentation and files, I think your uh, workbook says those are going to get posted by um, March 5th, which is Tuesday. So don't think about DLS 105 on Friday or over the weekend or whatever. We'll, we'll get back at it on Tuesday. And um, when we do uh, this next module, it's going to build off of the stuff that we've covered in Module 2. So we'll get more practice on how to do these things, but also add in other pieces to the project event tree, like um, gate inoperability or debris blockage. And then we'll also see what happens and how to do this when we've got an earthquake and two hazards to deal with. So um, Module 3 will be the last of the more labor-intensive hand calculations that you'll do. Um, from there, we'll get on to uncertainty, and then the rest of the way, we get to use all the, the nice tools that the RMC's put together to do all this stuff. So that's where we're headed. All right, well, I appreciate everybody calling in, um, and we will catch you in a couple weeks.